All right, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for tuning in today. I'm Francis Barrow, I'm the co-founder and CRO at Mad Kudu, and I'm really excited today uh, to walk you through some of our data-driven insights around freemium SaaS models. Uh, hopefully, the idea is that you know the insights we're going to cover today will help you either get started or you know go all the way to really scaling a freemium SaaS model. Um, as you'll see, my background initially is in data science and uh, you know mathematics, so a lot of this um, is going to cover maybe some like basic fundamentals of data analysis and all the way to some a little bit more uh, advanced elements. Um, but always with the idea of discovering how we can leverage all the data that's available to take better decisions and to really create a better um, experience for the customers. Uh, but in any case, that's me. I think enough about me. I think what you you really came uh, for here today is um, you know going to be the slides. So I'm just gonna make sure you have all the space you need here, and now we can really dive into it. Awesome. So. Um, maybe the um, quick element about Mad Kudu. So um, we are a um, lead scoring and account scoring um, platform where really, as I mentioned, right, the idea is to leverage all of the data that's available about your customers um, to create and orchestrate these relevant customer journeys at scale. Um, and along the way, we've been fortunate to work with some of the most amazing companies that are out there, you know, ranging from, um, you know, some amazing unicorns like Slack and Visions, um, and some of the more, I guess, established companies that are still showing some amazing growth, like an IBM, and then all the way to kind of like the new kids on the block, like an Algolia or a Segment or even a Gusto, uh, that again are showing some um, really fast scale. And so one of the amazing things about working with them is that we've been able to witness um, you know, what growth looks like at very different stages of, uh, of these SaaS models. Um, so really diving right into it and into um, the freemium elements, one of the very interesting things is that, you know, over the past few years, we've really seen um, the freemium model uh, take the SaaS world by storm. And part of my hypothesis around this is that, you know, freemium models are very appealing to um, the new generation of, uh, of founders that we are, right? They are, um, everyone is very excited by the fact that, um, you know, they appeal to a more technical uh, founding team, right? Because it seems like the product is going to sell itself. You build it and then people get to use it, get to experience the value from the product. And then from there, they're going to want to go and upgrade and pay, and it's wonderful. It looks like you don't necessarily need a sales team, but you know, as you scale and as you get to um, you know more established growth, you realize you actually do need sales. And one of the things that is really interesting is that I feel from what I've seen that the later stages of growth in the freemium model are yet to be fully and entirely understood. Uh, so again, that's part of why I'm really excited to start with some of the fundamentals, but also go into um, some of the more um, advanced and late stage insights around building a, a freemium model. So as I mentioned, right, when you're building a freemium model, as the word implies, it really starts with having a, um, a free portion of your product. So uh, here I'm actually going to use the pricing model from uh, Envision, which I think highlights very well uh, all these different tiers and how they operate uh, with one another. So as I said, you start with uh, a free version of the product. The idea is to get as many people as possible to go and adopt it. You really want to get like quick feedback and insights from your customers. So you want them to use it. You want to see what features they're using, where they're getting stuck so that you can learn from that. And at some point you can introduce an e-com sales motion where people are able to swipe their credit card, uh, and pay for the product uh, themselves. And then generally what happens is that, you know, you start raising some VC capital and um, you start thinking that it might be time to introduce, you know, an inside sales team that's going to go and close some of the more, um, you know, SMB, potentially mid-market companies that are using your product that have, you know, the potential to buy multiple seats. Uh, and that's really where you want to have a velocity sales team that's going to, you know, take these deals and close quite a lot of them um, every month. And then from that, generally, 
uh, you start seeing that you know you're getting like some Facebooks, um, some IBM, some Disney's that are signing up for your product, and you realize that your inside sales team is not necessarily you know geared or used to selling to these much larger companies that have a much more complex sales motion, and that's when um, you start an enterprise sales team. And, and generally, that's when things get a little bit more complicated, uh, and that's what we'll see uh, at the very end of this uh, presentation. But so maybe starting with, uh, with the fundamentals, I think a lot of the uh, amazing part about building freemium models is that because you're generally going to have a very high volume of, of users, it also means that you're going to be generating a high volume of data. So really, data analysis is at uh, the core um, of a good freemium model because you want to be constantly analyzing how things are going, learning from that, and improving your, uh, your product as well as your um, sales motion based on data analyses. And maybe the first thing I want to introduce here is because these analyses are going to be so important, it is really, really critical um, not to get them wrong. And one of the common pitfalls that I, I've witnessed over the years is um, you know, taking averages and deriving insights from averages. And so here, just want to show you a very quick example of um, something called the Simpson paradox, um, which is a, I'd say, statistical anomaly, however you want to call it, uh, that was made famous by um, the call it by UC Berkeley here in California um, for reasons that, that you'll see. It's, uh, it's very similar, but in this case, what we're looking at is we're saying that, you know, if we look at the data at a high level, what we're seeing is that um, you know, it seems like our good leads are performing worse than our bad leads. Uh, so if you look at the conversion rate, in this case, the uh, good leads are converting at 3.69% when the bad leads are converting at 3.73%. Um, so in that case, you know, if you look at this, you start wondering, well then, you know, why are we calling something a good lead if it's actually on average converting worse than a bad lead? Well, that's where things become interesting because if we actually break down uh, you know, these uh, conversion rates by uh, lead source, uh, what we end up finding is that you know, for demo requests, the good leads actually convert at more than 2x the conversion rate than the bad leads. And on product signups, they convert 5x compared to bad leads. So this is really interesting, right? Because what we're saying is that when we take the granular view of looking at conversion rates by lead source, our good leads every single time in every single lead source perform a lot better than our bad leads. However, when we look at the average, they actually convert worse. And so this is very, very counterintuitive, but the reason behind it is that the majority of our good leads are coming from product signups, and the average conversion rate of the product signup is, is the lowest, right? It's lower than the demo requests. However, our bad leads are coming at 50% from demo requests and at 50% from product signups. And therefore, their average is actually right in between the two. And so that's the reason why, ultimately, uh, when you look at it as an, as an average, overall, the bad leads seem to convert better um, than the good leads. And it's really just a matter of um, the distribution across lead sources. So I think this is, this is a really, really important element to, uh, to take into account. Again, it, this example is very specific, and, and it, you know, I use it because it happens a lot in, uh, in premium models where you're going to have a distribution of leads that might be skewed towards uh, one lead source or the other, generally a product signup, and product signups are always going to have a lower um, conversion rate to pay than demo requests. And so if you really look at things at the average and you don't break it down by lead source or some other element, then you know, the conclusions you're going to take from the data might be completely off. And I uh, just wanted to walk you through a quick case study of a, a customer of ours uh, where we found something similar um, in their data uh, to illustrate my point. So this company, again, was a uh, Freeman model, uh, really high volume, uh, and we're talking for, you know, 30,000 B2B signups a month, um, their SaaS. Uh, and you know, when they came to us, um, the graph we're looking at was what they were seeing from a daily retention standpoint. So what we're seeing here is that essentially 
um, from day one uh, to day two, there's only about 50% of the cohort that is going to be active, which means that 50% um, of the people who sign up never come back a second time to the application. And so to them, they you know, reached out to Matt Cruz and hey guys, like, we need your help, we have a problem, like we're not able to retain uh, our users, we wanna figure out is there something about their behavior that we're not seeing, um, can you please look into the data uh, with your models to figure out what we're doing wrong? And so, you know, because we've seen this before, the first thing that we really looked at was saying, well, let's not look at the average retention rate and essentially let's think about, you know, doing some segmentation. And so the first element we did was to uh, break down, you know, the different cohorts uh, by quality. And so what we found immediately was that, you know, because they were getting a lot of, uh, a lot of signups, not all of them were qualified for the product. Not all of them were actually a good fit to use the product. And actually what we found was that about 75% of, um, of the signups were either you know, spam or disposable emails or prosumers, and essentially were not a fit for the paid uh, version of the product and nor necessarily were they for, uh, for the product. And it was probably you know, about 15% of the signups that were indeed uh, a good fit. And so then we decided what happens if we take this daily uh, retention and we actually break it down by the quality of the leads. Um, and that was you know, the first aha moment for them because now what we realize is that for the good, uh, you know, for the qualified leads, for the, the leads that are a good fit for the product, what we're seeing is that you know, their day two retention was actually over 80%, which is actually a really good number. Um, you know, and even more than that, what we were seeing was that by day 25, um, and the very good leads were showing a daily retention of about 75%. So what that means is that out of all the good fit leads that were signing up for the product, three quarters of them were still active more than 25 days after their signup. So in fact, what was really interesting was that while the entire company um, was right now, you know, at that point in time, focusing on retention and trying to figure out how do we get people to keep on using the product after day two, the true problem that they had and the problem they had to solve was how do I get these people that are a good fit for my product that are still active after 25 days to actually buy the product? And so this is really, really compelling because all the energy of the company of the sales team, of the product team was focused on retention when the actual problem that they had and what they had to solve for was conversion down funnel. And this all came from just running an analysis at the highest level and just like taking the average retention rates of a given cohort and not contextualizing it to, to segment and to remove the leads that might not be a great fit. So that's number one. I guess the really the learning from this is that when you're doing a freemium model, you're going to have a lot of data. There's going to be a lot of junk signups. There's going to be signups that are not necessarily junk, that are just not a fit for your product. And you want to make sure that whenever you're trying to better your product, um, you really look at you know, data analyses that are focused around your ideal customer profiles and not around just your average signups. So now moving into um, kind of a, a second learning, which is more um, you know, still towards segmentation. And, and in this case, we're really going to look at, um, again, when you're trying to optimize your product, uh, really knowing what is the metric you're optimizing for and how that can lead to very different insights. And so as we mentioned before, right, when we're in the, I'd say, like relatively early days of our freemium model, what we have is, so we have this free plan, we're gonna have the e-com sales motion where we want people to adopt the product themselves and then to swipe their credit card. And we have our uh, inside sales team that's going to be um, you know, pushing people through a typical uh, high touch sales motion. And so in this case, the, the part that's, um, that I want to touch upon is how, uh, when you're looking at uh, two different metrics, which could be um, you know, activation of the product versus uh, conversion, self-serve conversion on the product. Um, you know, learnings might be different and therefore you might have two teams that are pulling in different directions. Um, so what we're going to represent is 
we're going to do a persona, a persona analysis and we're going to spread those personas against two different axes. So uh, in this case, um, on the x-axis, we're going to look at e-com conversion. So um, the closer people are to the right, uh, the more prone they are uh, to self-serve conversion and to swipe in that credit card. And then on the y-axis, we're going to have product activation. So the higher up people are, the more likely these personas are to activate the product. Um, and so what we find is that, you know, typically, um, you know, people like C-level are going to be great at, you know, the e-com conversion. So they're typically people who, when they sign up, uh, when, or when they get added to an instance of the product, they really come in to uh, swipe the credit card and to, uh, and to convert. Um, however, you know, potentially if we look at some individual contributors or we take the example of, of marketing in this case, marketing is going to be a core user of the product. So um, they actually have a strong propensity to activate the product because when they sign up, it's really to evaluate it and to use it and they want to get value from the product. But they don't necessarily have uh, the buying potential and they're not going to be the ones to swipe the credit card. Um, and so really, if you start plotting uh, all the different personas uh, against these two axes, what we find out is that, you know, if you're optimizing for product activation, then from a demand gen standpoint, you're going to want to go and, you know, focus towards these uh, marketers or designers, potentially analysts, because you know that they activate the product at a higher level. But on the flip side, if you're really trying to optimize towards your um, you know, self-serve conversions, now you want to go towards um, more senior executives, right, directors, and, and C-level people in the company. And so the interesting thing is like, if you only bring in these C-levels, you're not gonna see activation of the product. So it starts introducing the fact that you know, it, nothing is, is black or white, and that based on what you're trying to optimize for, you might end up with different conclusions. And the idea here is that there's not one conclusion that's better than the other. Um, you actually need a bit of both, right? You need people to be able to activate the product at, and you need people to be able to, um, to convert on the product. And so really, you know, all your demand gen so should take that into account to be able to um, bring the right, um, I would say persona mix um, to the table. And so if we take that um, one step further, uh, now, if we go to, you know, maybe a little bit more later stage and let's say you start having some of these bigger companies that are signing up your product that are adopting it. And now you want to have a team that's maybe less on the velocity closing side of things with more on enterprise selling. So you want to go and close some of the bigger companies and the bigger logos that are signing up your product. And now you have this enterprise sales team that's in there. Well, uh, again, the thing that's going to be very interesting is that um, if you look at, you know, typical conversion rates, and again, uh, uh, this is a, a case study from uh, um, one of our awesome customers, uh, AppQ, so the numbers have been obfuscated, obviously, for um, privacy reasons, but um, what they provide is an awesome tool to, uh, uh, to do tool tips for um, product usage, and what they were seeing was that you know they had real strong success with their velocity sales team that was able to close deals very quickly. They were finding who was a good fit for the product and closing them at a high rate. But they were also starting to see that there were some much bigger companies that were signing up for the product and adopting it, and they wanted to figure out how to go close them. But one of the things they were seeing is that those bigger companies were not necessarily marked as, uh, as a great fit. And so what's really interesting is that, you know, inherently, because, again, the average conversion rate um, of your enterprise deals is going to be a lot lower than the average conversion rate of your velocity sales team, if you just try to optimize for um, conversion rate, then you're going to mark your enterprise leads as a bad fit. And that actually is the case, right? Because when you think of it, if you're only doing velocity sales, then enterprise is not a good fit. Enterprise companies are never going or rarely going to be a good fit for velocity deals. And on the flip side, if you want to do enterprise sales, well, then velocity um, companies are not necessarily ideal because um, they're not going to close at a very high ACV. And so maybe putting that uh, into context now, if we consider that we're at this point where we have, you know, 
an e-com uh, potential conversion. We have an inside sales motion, but we also have you know enterprise sales. What happens now is that when we look at every single company or you know sign up for our product, they actually might have very different propensities against each of these sales motions. And so, in this case, for example, if say let's say a MongoDB, right? MongoDB is an awesome fit for enterprise sales, right? It's going to be a complex sales motion. You're going to have to go through procurement, uh, probably sign DPAs and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so they're not going to be your typical uh, velocity deal where people sign up for the product, you get them to, to use it, and then you know the reps can have um, a one-call sale. And they're not either going to be great for e-com where you can help them to swipe their credit card and just give you access to their data. Uh, on the flip side, then, if we look at, in this case, List Runner, um, like a smaller company, um, these folks are actually not a fit at all for the enterprise sales because their uh, potential ACV is way too low, um, you know, to allow for uh, an enterprise rep to make sense to talk to them. They might be a good fit for uh, inside sales because they might be adopting the product and they might have a couple final questions to kind of push them over the line. But ultimately, what we want to do is these folks is really uh, to get them through the e-com sales motion because they are going to generate the type of ACV where we want to have as little uh, human touch as possible and we really want to make the product as frictionless as possible for them to adopt and then convert. Um, and so again, this is really interesting because it goes back to saying that out of all your signups, um, not all of them are going to be good fits for the product. And then later stage, not all of them are going to be the right fit for the type of sales motion you're optimizing for. So now essentially we're saying we're going to a new level of granularity where we're saying beyond the product affinity and being a good fit for uh, the product you have to sell, you're also going to have an affinity to a given sales motion. And figuring that out and understanding how you actually qualify and filter um, your different signups based on which sales motion is going to be the right one for them it is extremely important to make sure that you know you're not trying to push MongoDB to a, an e-com conversion the same way that you're not sending DPAs and you know 10-page MSAs uh, for review to a company like List Runner who doesn't want to have to pay for legal fees you know to convert at $19 a month. So again. Very important to run additional segmentation once you start having these uh, additional sales motions. And so maybe diving into um, the final part here, I know we started touching upon enterprise sales and freemium, um, which is really this kind of final stage of, of growth on, on freemium models. I think it's really the most interesting because it's the part that is today um, the least understood and where a lot of companies, you know, start stalling and, and where it, it can become a little bit harder. And, you know, really the reason for that is that when you start getting into enterprise selling, you start hitting the limits of, uh, of freemium. So if you think of, you know, how freemium works again and how enterprise works, there, there's something that doesn't necessarily align very easily, right? So, Enterprise sales, they're fairly well known for, you know, taking a long time. Um, typically, people are going to have lists of target accounts. They're going to, you know, increase the penetration within the account. They need to work with multiple people to, to get the deal going. So it's a really, uh, it's a long sales cycle. Uh, you need to have reps that are, like your enterprise reps are going to be your most expensive reps because they need to be able to do um, very different things than, uh, an inside sales team, generally they're going to have more experience. You're going to have cost of lawyers and things like that. And so there's a really high cost of sales. But then because you are operating a premium model, um, your, your you know, ACV typically scales relatively linearly, right? Because it's going to be hard to get um, a blanket uh, contract with a customer when you have a pricing that's you know clearly defined per seats uh, on the website so that's where you start introducing things like you have an enterprise plan that's going to cover you know additional security settings user management all these features but there's still something 
emotionally that can be hard for these enterprise companies that are saying, well, I already have three people using the product and we're paying, I don't know, $50 a month. I don't understand why we would need to increase that tenfold uh, to move on to your enterprise plan. And so essentially what you're creating is a low ceiling for your ACV and a high cost of sales. Um, and so that's, that's one of the, the really hard things uh, about, uh, about freemium if you're not able to, to focus right away on the, on the right leads. And that's made even harder by the fact that, you know, when you look at all the signups that you're having, when you have this successful, um, you know, demand gen and, and marketing efforts that are bringing in all these awesome companies to your, um, your freemium product is that your enterprise reps can be overwhelmed because they're just seeing this, you know, plethora of awesome logos that are coming through the pipe. And so they want to go after each and every one of them. But the problem is, um, you know, not all of them are going to be ready to close uh, right now. And so part of what you want to enable your reps to do is to go and, you know, within this myriad of customers, identify which are the couple ones that are, you know, ready for a conversation and then might be uh, ready to close. And so right now, I, I think, I mean, beyond kind of the theoretical aspect, really all of this is a bit of a case study of something that we've been running with uh, this awesome company called um, Cold Envision app that provides a, uh, a design software. And yeah, they've been seeing tremendous success on their uh, demand gen exercises. And so showing huge growth and a massive volume of leads that are coming through. And so, I'm going to walk quickly through these different steps, but this is just to show uh, the maturity that they were at uh, when we started doing this, you know, this final stage of enterprise selling uh, for the company. And really the idea is to say, these are some of the more uh, fundamentals and basics that you really need to have before you start thinking about scaling your enterprise selling in a freemium model. So what happened is that, you know, first off, obviously, we, you know, we focused on optimizing the full MQL process. So we're saying when we have someone raise their hand for a demo request and they are a good fit, we want to really quickly reach out to them, make sure they have the right rep talking to them and that uh, they can close. And so that part, you know, we hit diminishing returns where all the efforts have been put in place and it seemed like it was really hard to get, you know, a two X uh, increment on, uh, on returns there. Um, we also had done a lot of the PQL optimization. So that's, you know, optimizing everything on the e-commerce and uh, inside sales motion where we're saying, you know, we can find the companies that are uh, adopting the product where there's, you know, a single user or a couple users that are showing strong interest that are um, using the product. And, and again, that we're kind of maxing out on, you know, trying to get uh, more people to convert. Uh, on the enterprise side, what we we're seeing was that, you know, sales was not the issue. So we were generating all of these amazing leads from marketing um, that were great fits, that were using the product. And so because we were not closing them, the first question, obviously, as you know, marketers, is we wonder if sales is the culprit. And so what we found was that um, when we started monitoring the SLA uh, between sales and marketing was that, you know, sales was actually hitting their SLA. So they were talking to the right leads. They were reaching out to them quickly. Um, and the feedback that we were getting from the sales team was that, you know, these leads were actually the right people they wanted to talk to. They were the right types of companies, but the accounts were not ready to purchase an enterprise plan. And so this is the most um, important element was that as an account, the account was not ready to grow from, you know, a small footprint to becoming, um, a full on, uh, a full on customer. And, and what was really interesting was that, you know, for Envision, this was not just uh, an exercise from a, you know, just purely sales and marketing standpoint. This was also something that had, you know, uh, board level visibility. And so essentially what happens was that they started wanting to track what was their, um, you know, the penetration from a usage standpoint and from a uh, enterprise uh, conversion standpoint within target accounts. So what they would do would be create a set of target accounts and see over time um, how are they increasing that uh, that penetration. And of course, you know, uh, free usage was the easiest to grow. And then after they were growing free usage, we were able to go and then get more people to 
move on to uh, the enterprise plans. But the way uh, this was approached was to introduce a new concept and to think of um, you know, acquisition in a new way, which is kind of the evolution of the, the PQLs, and we call it the marketing qualified accounts. And the idea behind the marketing qualified account is to say that um, you know, we're selling B2B, right? So we're selling to accounts. So it doesn't matter if we have a user that's active. At the end of the day, what really matters is that you know, we have an account that's ready for a purchase. And I think more interestingly, what we we're seeing is that when we were considering these enterprise leads, um, very often they were not hitting our PQL threshold. So no individual lead was ever showing enough behavior to hit that PQL threshold and therefore get sent to sales. But then when we looked at it from an account standpoint, what we were seeing was that you know, each user was actually part of um, a more broader network of other users uh, from the same company that were also showing some adoption of the product. And then when we actually combined all of those people's behavior together, what we were seeing was that even though none of them individually should be sent to sales, the account very often could be sent to sales because at an aggregate level, we were seeing enough activity from the account to consider that they were ready for a purchase. Um, and so this was really a transformational uh, element of the sales motion for, for Envision because they stopped thinking of enterprise sales as um, you know, a one-man uh, one land and expand and trying to go after one user and really to think about it as you know, we want the account to be ready and for the account to be ready, we need to have multiple people using the product. And so maybe you know, going back to one of the analyses that we ran before, um, the next step then was to understand, well, okay, if we have a bunch of people that are engaged from, uh, from let's say Disney, who do I go after? Let's say I have 20 users that are showing activity in the product, uh, who's really going to be the, the one I want to talk to? And again, we, we can represent this against this uh, uh, two-dimensional axes that I think are, are helpful to understand uh, how to you know, prioritize your outreach. And so in this case, what we're doing is uh, on the, um, on the x-axis, we're looking at closed one opportunity, which is typically what the AEs are going to be focusing on. And then on the y-axis, we're looking at opening opportunities, which is what SDRs focus on. And what we find, again, is that we have different personas that are going to fit in different places on this graph. And so essentially, uh, what we're showing here is that we're identifying a set of champions, people that are going to be using the product and that are willing to talk to you and willing to open an opportunity. These are the people you want to go after um, you know, to get the account engaged from a sales motion standpoint, not from a product standpoint. And then you have a set of people that are uh, your buyers. You know, these are your economic buyers, the people who are going to sign the contract and the people that the AEs want to see on the account. And so these are people that you want to bring into the deal, potentially after the deal is created, but they're close to mandatory to make sure that you can uh, close the account. And so this is really interesting, again, because we go back to showing how within you know, one team, which is the sales team, we're able to have you know, two types of ideal personas that are gonna have very different roles and that are extremely important for um, the sales motion. And maybe the image I would like to, um, to leave you with here um, is to think of it as um, you know, B2B SaaS sales is like the Lord of the Rings. And what I mean by that is um, if we look at this you know, timeline of the, the Lord of the Ring movies with all the different, uh, um, I guess, heroes and characters from, from the fellowship, what we see is that you know, there's, it, it's a very complex story. There's a lot of different things that happen. And what's really interesting is that all of this is one single motion from you know, the creation of the fellowship all the way to destroying the ring in Mordor. And, not all of the characters are going to make it all the way to the end, but each of them are playing a part in the story, right? Each of them have play a critical uh, part, which is going to help Frodo at the end of the day destroy the ring. So again, like the, um, the element here is to think of it as, you know, who are uh, your champions who are going to bring the ring all the way to, um, uh, you know, to the fellowship and who are your buyers who are going to take that ring uh, from the fellowship and then bring it all the way to the destruction and then who are the people 
in the middle who are going to help you, um, you know, go through some of the challenges that, you know, inherently happen uh, in there. And I'm not saying that, you know, legal are the orcs that you have to overcome, but you can think of it that way. So why am I excited about all of this? Uh, I think ultimately um, what we've been seeing in the market is that there's a really strong and radical shift in marketing from, you know, going from uh, the more brand uh, oriented vision that we had of marketing all the way to, um, you know, operations. Today, I think the main um, differentiator and the main skill that people are going to be looking for in marketers is their ability to leverage data um, to make sense of the data and to really be able to drive the right decisions based off of that. And so as marketing leaders, it's really your responsibility to understand how you can use this data and leverage it to make it your competitive advantage. Um, so really, I think I encourage you to dive more and more uh, into this and, and just to be constantly data driven because um, that's going to be what is really going to separate um, the winners uh, from the rest of the pack. So hopefully, um, you know, these insights were, were helpful. Um, I am available at francis at madcoo.com. So feel free to shoot me an email if you have any, you know, follow up question, if there's anything um, we can help you with.